It's my pleasure to see you today for our final session in the 2D to 3D Rios Contra Cancer Curriculum. And today we're going to focus on a take home message that I hope you can carry on with you even after this finishes. And this is how to deal with challenges that might come up. You've all come a long way in this course and we've covered aspects ranging from the physics to the contouring, to the symmetry, to QA and setup positioning and imaging. And as you do this, there will be challenges that arise, but you can always reach out to us and we're happy to help with these. Today, Dr. Piotr Dabrowski, one of our co-course directors is going to give a presentation on dealing with challenges. So without further ado, um, Sarah will translate this in Arabic, and then Dr. Drabowski. Hello, everyone. I'm Sadi, my sisters and sisters. Today, the conversation will be about the challenges. A last message and important after the course, and you will benefit from it a lot in your lives, in the future, in the future, in the future. The message of the conversation is one of the الرئيس المحاضرين الرئيسيين في المجموعة دكتور بيوتر دبراسكي ومن غير إطالة أتمنى لكم محاضرة مثمرة ومفيدة جدا إن شاء الله ويلا نبدأ we can start alright thank you for the introduction guys um, so like Ben mentioned <coughs> this will be kind of dealing with challenges um, but first before we continue I want to congrats give the congratulations to everybody here uh, you know this took a long time for everybody uh, and you guys, you know, you guys um, show a lot of uh, perseverance and, and a lot of uh, growth by kind of coming to these sessions. And, you know, the pursuit of knowledge is really what is the, the important part. You know, gaining knowledge is, is good, but always looking ahead and always trying to go further is what makes you guys great. And that's a huge thing. And congratulations to you guys for all that. And Ben also mentioned, you know, obviously the what's next is um, it's a good question. So the RCC actually has other courses that you can look at as well, um, or um, even better, teach these courses as well to your colleagues. Uh, and so there's other courses available through the RCC or through other training if, you, if that's something that you want to do. But um, I think you know my take home message is that you guys have already showed so much promise that you want to learn and never stop that. Just always learn and always get better. And that's really the best way to overcome any challenges that you will face in the clinics. And challenges are inevitable. Uh, no matter how prepared you are, no matter how prepared your clinic is, something's always going to be, um, that's going to come up. There's going to be some chaos. We, we're, we work in a very dynamic healthcare environment, uh, especially you guys. You treat an incredible amount of patients. It's very fast paced. So I want to you know, congratulate you on that. But as you know, there's always going to be challenges. There's going to be something that's going to come up and you have to face it quickly and solve it quickly. And it's not easy often. One of the biggest challenges that we face in radiation therapy are missed treatments. Um, so whether it's in a, you know, in the in, on the west here or in a lot of middle income countries, missed treatments are, are very very common. Uh, the UK actually did an audit of their patients. It's really nice. The UK has you know the whole cancer registry in, in, together in one giant uh, database, and they found out that about 65% of their head and neck patients had at least one missed treatment or more. Right, so almost you know, a, a majority of, pa of patients have mistreatments. And, but when they kind of put in some policies and some guidelines, they reduced that very quickly down to about 12 patients, 12 uh, percent. Right? So there's a lot to be done uh, that can be done for mistreatments. And um, from some of the work I've done with Kenya and um, Tanzania, mistreatments are very common there as well. Uh, and so I think this is, a, a, in terms of challenges, it's something that I'll focus the talk on and then get to a little bit of uh, other things later on. So this is actually all I'm going to highlight this because this this UK policy that I found was it's incredible. It's very detailed. It's very, very well written. Uh, it's a really good example of what an interruption treatment interruption policy looks like. Uh, so if you have time, you can go look at it. You can base your own on there if, on this if you, if you don't have it. But clear policies in an emergency, whether it's a mistreatment or anything else, are, are, are gold. Um, you don't have to think about anything. You can just jump right into action if you have a policy in front of you if you have tolerances that you've agreed on if you have uh, everything that you 
you know, you as a clinic have decided, you can act on it very quickly. It doesn't matter. Do, do mistreatments matter? Um, so we model mistreatments. Sorry, guys. I can't remember. So mistreatments, uh, and we model them using this sort of dog leg or hockey stick um, kind of, uh, approach where the, uh, can you guys see my mouse? I, I hope you can. There's a flat part of this. So this is a, a, a graph of total dose that you need into, in order to achieve some local control versus the length of treatment for the course of, of, of treatment. So there's the flat portion here that basically is the indeterminate of, or, uh, indiscriminate of how long you take to finish the treatment. You don't need to increase those. So whether you finish the patient in three weeks or a couple extra days, uh, that's fine. But as soon as you get past this delay time point, it becomes a slope. Uh, and what that means is basically any delay after that po uh, point, you have to add on a little bit of dose in order to uh, compensate for the loss of local control. And this time delay or delay time, excuse me, is unique to not only tumor histology, so like what kind of tumor you're treating, but also to the actual treatment itself. So like a chemo rad versus just radiation alone will have different uh, parameters. So you have to you know, take it complicated. So basically, you know, going over this again, let's say that this little green dot that you were supposed to finish uh, at a certain time with a certain dose, right? So you can see these little green dots. Uh, however, let's say there is this uh, area of uh, delay for the patient. They missed a week, let's say. So now you have your new uh, end time has been pushed back somewhat. And as a result, you have to increase the amount of dose that you have to give in order to achieve the same local control, in order to achieve the same effect. So yes, it does matter, but not equally, right? So uh, there's strong evidence showing that for fast growing tumors, um, you actually have to be very careful with this, that this, this, this um, compensation that you, you need to take into account. So this is like head and neck squamous cells, cervix, lung, both non-small uh, non and small cell, esophagus, uh, anal screams, and medulla blastomas. Uh, and note too that um, when we talk about the treatment time, if you're doing something like a brachy and uh, external radiation or a chemo and external radiation, you actually have to look at the combined time uh, for the treatment course. Uh, so basically, not only do you have to be within your own department, within your own group to be you know, efficient and make sure the patients don't miss treatment, you also have to be uh, aware of what the other side is doing, make sure that the brachy doesn't have a huge delay, make sure that the chemo is delivered as quickly as, as it can be without loss of uh, delay. And if you're looking for numbers, uh, some of us love numbers to kind of take out. So it's about a percent to 3% loss of local control per day that you extend the patient's treatment, ideally, uh, ideal treatment, or up to 25% uh, for loss for a, a whole week of treatment loss, right? So these are pretty significant uh, issues. But like I said, not all evidence is strong. So for things like GBMs and bladder cancers, so even though that we consider them fast growing, they don't seem to show a lot of evidence that delays um, have an uh, effect on either survival or local control. Um, other tumors, like slow-growing tumors, um, for example, anal cancer when it's, uh, it's a chemo reg RT regimen, or prostate cancers, they tend to be thought of as a little bit more slow-growing tumors, and they can type tolerance, um, they can take up to about a five days break without showing any significant reduction in, um, in local effect. And likewise for breast, uh, you can think of it, but about a week break is, is adequate, um, or is okay rather. Uh, however, shorter course, you know, breasts are moving to shorter and shorter courses, three weeks. Uh, so those regimens we're not sure yet, uh, or there isn't actual evidence. And palliative treatments, again, we kind of think of them as kind of insignificant in terms of timing. Um, but again, there's evidence to show that if you delay or space out or have a big break in a palliative treatment, your palliation effect, um, palliative effect gets reduced as well. So it's important to get those treated as quickly as possible as well. So with that, the, that UK policy takes all this data and it does a really, really nice job. So I really suggest if anybody's kind of creating a policy for themselves to use this as a model, they take this data and they categorize these patients or these tumor histologies into three categories. Category one is basically do not extend treatment at all. Um, you know, what, do whatever you can to make sure the patient finishes on time. And there's a list of, you know, basically recommendations and, and um, uh, tumor histologies and treatment approaches 
uh, that would fall into this. So again, it's really nice if you the machine goes down and you're scrambling to figure out which patients to to, to triage. You can just basically look on this policy. You know, okay, this patient has small cell lung. Let's make sure we get you or get the, get the patient treated. Category two patients, uh, they allow up to two additional days uh, for their um, for their treatment. So you can they can miss two days without any sort of compensation. And those would be the breasts, the bladders, and the prostates. And category three, they're allowed up in the, to miss up to five days. Sorry, I forgot about the time. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to type in the chat. Um, uh, so yeah, for category three, that's for mostly the palliative patients, and that can you know you can have up to a week or seven day um, break without you know without any sort of uh, compensations that you need to do. So you can see you know again having this very nice laid out categories of patients and how to handle them when the machine does go down, when a patient, you know, doesn't show up for treatment because they can't make it here for whatever reason, you know, it becomes very easy to jump into action and to start to work instead of thinking of, oh, which patients do we stop? Who do we talk to? Uh, so I really like this. I think it's a, it's a wonderful way to approach a policy. Um, timing also, uh, the question, you know, is very common of just timing, like where in the patient's um, uh, treatment does an uh, interruption take? Does it does it matter? Uh, and the, I think the short answer is no. It doesn't really matter whether the break happens up front or in the middle or at the end. It kind of all it seems to to basically have no support one way or the other. However, if a break happens towards the end of the patient's treatment, you just have a lot less options. You have a lot less time. If a patient loses misses a week but only has two days left of their original treatment, you only have two days to try and do something with that in order to kind of hit that mark. Um, so your lim your options become limited the later that a break happens, and so it, it becomes maybe more tricky. So how do you compensate for a patient uh, when they do mistreatment? Because it will happen. So number one, and this is sort of the ideal, I'll talk about this a little bit later in a little bit more detail, is transfer them to a different machine. So ideally, you know, you have a matched machine, uh, and therefore if the machine goes down, if there's a breakdown, if there's something wrong, you just move that patient to the other machine, uh, and there's no delay, they get treated on the same day, and everything is, you know, everything is the same. If you don't have matched machines, if you have different machines, you can actually replan them very quickly or as quickly as you can. Um, and this is obviously very tough, but it's useful for longer delays. You can, if you know the machine, your, your original treatment machine is going to be down for like three or four days, you can actively replan them onto a different machine and continue treatment as, as best as you can. So this is, you know, your ideal uh, uh, compensation. Compensation mechanism. Uh, kind of moving down the list, uh, you can accelerate the fractionation. Uh, so basically, if you can't do number one, what you can do is if a, if a patient misses a fraction or two, you can uh, treat that fraction on a weekend or a holiday. So all of our um, treatment regimens include breaks for the weekend. Uh, so if a patient misses, you know, on Wednesday, you can actually treat them on the Saturday or the Sunday. Or if there's a holiday, you can treat them on that holiday. And again, the pro is that there's, you know, you're not prolonging their treatment course. The con is you have to get people scheduled. You have to treat on a weekend. You have to make sure the staff and clinic are available. And you have to make sure that the quality of care on a weekend is going to be the same as original. Uh, or alternatively, what you can do is you can treat them twice on the same day. Uh, so using these BID fractions. And this is what we do all the time. Um, so again, the, 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 the pro is that you're not extending the patient's uh, treatment schedule uh, at all. Uh, the con is that, you know, patient satisfaction, transporting and scheduling issues can kind of be pretty tough. Patients have to come twice uh, in the same day, six hours apart at minimum. The longer, the better. But we, we have to have a, a, a hard cut off at six hours. So they have to come in in the morning and then in the afternoon. And transport can be difficult. Um, patients, you know, don't want to do that. Um, and so it can be a little bit challenging to get patients in for these BID treatments, but again, uh, you know, you have to do it in order to kind of um, make sure that they get the, the right um, uh, 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 control from the, from the, from the regimen. And again, doing BID fractions only works well if you're not already hypofractioning the treatment. So if you're already going at a very high dose rate, you probably don't want to be treating the patient twice uh, in the same day because that's probably going to be uh, not, not good. 
If you can't do either of the two um, easier ways, I would say, to compensate for mistreatment, you can actually go into the biological compensation. Um, so this is often the case when you're, again, at the end of a treatment course, you don't have much time to play with, you can't, you can't push the patient, you know, four or five fractions of DID uh, back to back. And so you have to look at extending the dose and increasing the dose. So you can do this by either increasing the total dose and keeping the dose fractions the same or increase and or increasing the dose per fraction uh, for each of those. And the, the, bar, the, the BED calculations that you have to do, they get pretty complicated. Uh, they're not complicated, but they get pretty um, tricky because they're very dependent on what tissues you're looking at, right? So this is the equation. Um, you know, these are the parameters, but really the alpha beta ratio, this um, the delay time or time delay and this K factor, they're all dependent on your, what, you're, what you're looking at, right? So your tumor histology, the treatment type, um, and so it becomes very tricky to select the right uh, parameters and you can make mistakes. Uh, I was going to work through some examples, but I found this, um, this paper down here by Dale in clinical oncology uh, that has really a great step-by-step -step, um, bunch of examples that you can go through on your own if you want. You really see the details that they go into and that you can see and kind of gain appreciation that it can be pretty tricky to select the right parameters. And ultimately, um, you can't compensate for it the same. You basically, when you get into biological compensation, you have to select, because the alpha beta ratio is you're either selecting for early uh, responding tissues or late responding tissues, you can't have both. So you have to do the BED calculation to basically keep your tumor dose the same or your, 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 your local control effect the same, but that will increase your late toxicity. Or you do it the other way where you keep the late toxicities the same, but more, like, more than likely your tumor dose is gonna um, go down. And so you have to, you know, work with a clinician, with a, with, a, with a physician to really figure out what it is that you want by case by case basis. Maybe this patient, you know, maybe your constraints were already met really well. There's nothing around there. Maybe you can increase the late tissue toxicities a little bit uh, without, um, without worry or the other way around. Okay, you, have to, you have to really watch it. This patient has already had radiation in the past. You don't want to irradiate anything um, and, and give any extra dose to normal tissues. And so you would underdose the treatment in this case. So really to do that, you're either, the best way to do it is to, again, try and keep to the original time. Um, and so you would increase the dose per fraction for the, the fractions after your treatment. So you kind of make up the missing dose bit by bit every day, or you increase the total dose by adding extra fractions and you're, you, know, you do extend the patient's treatment time. So again, if you do want examples, uh, there's examples uh, in, the, in this paper that, that are really, really good. So what are some of the causes for um, machine breakdown? So um, the, causes, the most common cause, which I'm sure all of you know, is machine breakdown, right? So um, it happens a lot, and it feels like it happens a lot. But really, Linux, modern Linux, are pretty robust. Um, I looked through some literature, and I think about uh, much more than 90%, up to 95% of the, the, the Linux operational time is, is fine. Um, although it is significantly lower in um, low to middle income countries, and I'll kind of talk about the reasons why later. Additionally, in, IT infrastructure is really important too. Um, as we move from 2D to 3D, you know, in 2D on a cobalt machine, for example, you can have a piece of paper and you can deliver that treatment very easily just by programming the machine based on your parameters. As you move into 3D, and especially as you, you know, move further into IMRT and VMAT, this becomes impossible, and you really rely on data transfer, right? Which is great because it's you know it's nice and safe. You know you have you have complete connected systems that talk to each other, and there isn't an opportunity to miss anything. But um, but network stability becomes very important. So IT plays a huge role. We've had IT go down, or our, our networks go down, and basically everybody stops. Facilities is really important too, and I guess again, I mean, for um, sort of you know developing nations, this is really stable power is kind of something that we take for granted. Uh, but I know in a lot of your places, um, having stable power is just an, an issue. You know, with weekly power outages, uh, these are you know Linux are very sophisticated machines. Um, they they need stable power. They're kind of they need cooling. They need chilled water. And so um, what can happen is, you know, these facilities, even though those, everything is fine, the actual building, the hospital can't supply the power, can't supply the, the cooling that it needs. And as a result, you know, you'll go down. 
And something that we found out uh, last year was door functionality. One of our doors broke uh, and it took about a week and a half to get a motor in from wherever the motor was built. And we were down for an, a week and a half, which is very, very challenging. Uh, and staffing shortages, right? Uh, I think we all learned that um, Sorry, Piotr, I muted oh. you by mistake while I'm muting other people. <laughs> no, no problem. I took the hint, but thanks. Uh, um, and and I, I just wanted to, uh, on this slide, it talks about Linux uptime. Mm -hmm. And uh, just for those, um, uptime is with the time that the Linux is, is up and running correctly. So the time that the Linux will operate without an issue. We want that to be as high as possible. But uh, what he's saying is that you know there could be many times in your know, countries where that's much lower. Um, maybe in, in some places the Linux is broken sixty percent of the time. Yeah, and actually, you know, we have a service contract with Varian, and you know, the nice thing about having these service contracts with a vendor is that you can specify, you can tell them, I need it. You, know, you can negotiate this number. I need it up. 98% of the time or 95% of the time. And if they don't meet that mark, you know, basically you get money back for the contract. And so there's like, it's, it's a really nice thing to, to have in there. So even though service contracts are very expensive, um, you can kind of play to make, to make it, um, to ensure that they will actually get the machine running for you as much as, much as they can. Um, okay, so moving on, I uh, kind of lost my mouse. No, still frozen. Oh, there we go. Um, scheduling circumstances are really important too when you're scheduling patients. Uh, if you schedule patient starts towards the end of the week, um, just naturally because the way the, the weekends work and we usually work in week, you know, uh, most of our treatments are like uh, a multiple of five. By scheduling a patient to start on like a Thursday or Friday, you're going to end up with an extra weekend on there. Um, and so you have to kind of pay attention to that. That can have an effect on patients too. And obviously holidays. So there's some evidence to show that if a holiday lands on like a Wednesday versus creating a long three or four day weekend, um, that can be uh, more deleterious to the patient. Uh, and so what we do, if we do have a four day weekend, like around Christmas or around Thanksgiving in the US, we'll actually treat on the weekend before um, just to kind of compensate and make sure that the patients do get their full five fractions of their treatment. And obviously patient circumstances are really important. And I think this is something that a lot of um, uh, you would probably experience is, you know, patients either from the treatment himself or unrelated illnesses, they just can't come for treatment and they can't continue. Uh, so this is something that you have to manage actively with your, with your department. And again, it's been shown that providing guidance to the patient at the very start of treatment, how to care for themselves, involving the nursing team to give them educational, some sort of education about what to expect, how to care for themselves while they're undergoing treatment, uh, provides a better um, outcome for the patient, and therefore they can continue their treatments better. Uh, I've been also one thing to, to note, though, is that as you move from, you know, 2D treatments over to 3D treatments, the whole point of doing this is that you get better planning and get a de better delivery, and you can reduce these toxicities that you see. Um, you're not going to eliminate them because that's the nature of the game, but moving from 2D to 3D will allow you to spare a lot more tissues and Kind of be more conformal in your, in your treatment planning and therefore you know patients should should see less toxicity and should continue to treat uh, to, to come for treatments much more transportation and I should say housing here as well because I know a lot of um, a lot of your centers probably have patients coming from very far um, so you know inadequate transportation or inadequate housing can play a huge role um, in, in patients during treatment having having patients there during treatment and missing patients and this kind of goes to the second point is that uh, you have to explain to the patient the importance that they have to come every day and that they have to complete the, the treatment every day. Um, this is obviously less of a problem where we are because patients don't have to travel very far. I worked in a, in a center um, in, in British Columbia. There's some pictures back here of bears. It was very, very isolated. Um, it was like a five hour drive. Patients would drive about five hours sometimes to get treatment so they would stay with us. And we had these problems where patients would say, oh, I'm done with it, and they would leave. Um, and, and so we actually started getting patients to sign kind of these, you know, it wasn't legal or anything, but 
just having them sign something saying, yes, I agree to come for the full treatments, to be here every day, uh, made a big difference. And so involving their families as well was important to kind of communicate to the patient, hey, you have to do this. If you commit to something, you have to commit for the full thing. So this is very important. And of course, the unexpected. Uh, I think COVID hit us all this year. Um, and depending, you know, everybody was impacted by it one way or another, whether it was, you know, staff getting sick, patients getting sick. Uh, and so this caused a lot of turbulence, and a lot of chaos in our clinics. Um, and so I'm sure we've all dealt with it. So congratulations. But again, source, you know, even if you're prepared for everything, the unexpected can come and uh, help you. So I want to talk a little bit about mash machines so that this is the best solution. If you have a machine that goes down, the absolute best way to, to manage that is just by shipping the patient off to another machine. So if you have this, especially for busy, busy clinics, like a lot of your clinics are, it's so it's such a such a benefit to have a, a twin machine that you can just move a patient over. For scheduling, it makes schedules very fluid. Um, and so if you have the opportunity to start a new clinic or if you're buying a new machine in the future, I would highly recommend getting two machines that are exactly matched. Um, it's, it's just an amazing benefit to have. So what's in a match? Obviously, you have to look at what uh, energies you have on the machines. Make sure that the collimation systems are the same, you know, that it has the same wedges, can go to the same field size, the geometry. Also imaging systems, right? If your physician uh, created PPV margins that are very tight because they feel like they're gonna you know, do some very good imaging every day, and then you move that patient over to a machine that doesn't have that imaging, well, obviously you can't get that same alignment. And so there's something kind of to think about, which kind of leads to the next point as, um, uh, but different machines, even if they, they're the exact same type, they can be QA'd very differently. So one can be designed to be, or designated to be just an IMRT machine. The other one's got high tolerances. So, uh, you know, you have to make sure that, talk to physics to figure out, are you QAing the same way between these machines? Are they truly identical? Compatible immobilizations too. Um, we have different couches on a couple of our machines and it makes moving patients really difficult because, you know, if you created a, a, a a head frame on one, it won't fit on the other. It's kind of silly. Um, but that said, if there are differences between some machines, you can still transfer the patient. You just have to quantify the, the impact that you get. So if, you know, physically, if you can move the plan from one machine to the other, even though if there, there might be small dose differences, um, that's probably okay, as long as you have some policy to say, yes, okay, we know, for example, in Stanford, we have a couple of older Linux and a couple of newer true beams uh, and they're almost identical they're not perfectly identical and we know the MUs between them for a VMAP plan will differ about two percent and we're okay with that it's better than the patient missing you know three or four days of treatment in a row so we'll we'll do that transfer and we'll be okay there are some pitfalls though with transferring even to match machines you know the staff that you might be scheduling on that machine uh, might be unfamiliar with the patient. They won't know the setup as well as the original staff. And so there's issues there that can come up. There might be additional QA that you need to run on a machine. And obviously by moving a chunk of patients from one machine to the other, that schedule is gonna get very long. Um, and so you have to be very careful with how you schedule patients. Sure, do we, have have a, have a uh, we have a question Fiona, oh, yeah. for mm -hmm. the matched machines. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have two Linux with the same energy, um, can you transfer the patient from the, the machine that broke to the machine that's still running um, without doing a replan and recalculation? Uh, yeah, well, basically if, if the machine has, if I go back here, if the machine has the same MLCs, the same output factors, right? So you have to kind of talk to your physics group, but yes, yeah, if the machine has the same energy it's got the same beam parameters, you know, like to make sure that the, your, your output's calibrated the same way, that the field sizes can be, can ma are matched. So in that case, yeah, well, that's, that's basically what a matched machine is, is that you can then just take that plan, move it over without recalculating. Um, but you have to, uh, you have to work with your physics team or you have to work, you know, go through it in detail to make sure that it is truly a matched machine. And again, this is where the policy kind of kicks in is it's really nice to, figure out how you calibrated your machines, figure out, are they truly identical? And if so, perfect. We can just move patients back and forth, no problem. If there are some slight differences, you have to figure out, okay, there's you know maybe a 3% difference or a 2% difference, that's fine, we're not gonna replan. 
we're going to have just to make sure that we keep track of how many interactions we get. Or if there are major differences, for example, one is like a SSD of 80, one is SSD 100, then no, for sure you can't tra transfer the machine. So you really do have to do your work to figure out what's, what is a match um, and, and decide for yourselves there. But uh, we, for example, in, in my clinic here, <clears throat> we have two machines that are absolutely identical except for the MLCs are different and we can't transfer any patients. <laughs> so, uh, and we have to replan all of them. So it, it, it kind of really depends on what you have as a clinic. Good. And we have one other question. Um, <laughs> it's from uh, Roeda. Um, what do we do if a patient stops two months of treatment after being in another country? And it, it seems like this is a, a a scenario of it that probably comes up um, commonly. What I would say, Piotr, maybe if you can go um, to the slide that has the formula sure. so, that, um, so that people can really understand sort of an example. Um, so if two months is a very long time to mistreatment, and if, if the patient was was just starting they may need to start all over but let's say they were in the middle of their treatment you might need to compensate using some of the measures that Pioiter talked about so here this is the BED formula um, total dose times one plus your dose per day over the alpha beta let's say that let's say that this is um, equal to a hundred okay hundred gray and then T delay is that time at which the slope begins to increase and the, the slope is equal to K. So maybe it's um, one gray per day for every extra day that you're adding. Um, if you add on um, 60 days of missed treatment, this number is going to increase, this term is going to increase by 60 compared to normal. So essentially you're getting BED 100 minus 60 is only BED of 40. So, I mean, that's an extreme example, but you can see that really, if you just, if you just try to do it as normal, it, uh, it won't be sufficient. Um, so yeah, period, I don't know if you have anything to add. No, no, exactly. Um, I think it's a huge challenge for you guys. Um, like I kind of know the chaos that's there and people kind of leaving and, and it's really hard to get patients. So I think, like I said, um, you know, it's a really good example of two months. It's just a massive amount of time to miss and you're basically missing you know, the vast majority of the dose that you delivered. Um, but your late tissues are not missing that, right? So um, again, if you do an alpha beta correction for your normal tissues, your normal tissues feel that a little bit more. And so, you know, it, it's really important to communicate to patients up front that they're committing to something and make sure that they don't break. Um, and I think I sort of, that's my only, besides, you know, doing these alpha beta corrections and seeing it for yourself, how bad breaks are, uh, you know, communicating to the patient at the very beginning how important it is not to come, or excuse me, to come. And if they can't, if they know that they're going to have a break, it's actually oftentimes, at least for us, I'm not sure for you, Ben, if that's the same, we'll actually wait. Like if we know a patient's going to have something that they can't, absolutely cannot <clears throat> um, get out of, whether it's, you know, they have to go somewhere for work, uh, we'll actually wait and hold to start the treatment, or we'll do everything we can to finish the treatment before they leave, right? So, you have to work with the patient a little bit um, to make sure that they understand and that you can do what you can to make it um, make it feasible to treat give the to give, treat these deliveries or treat these plans as best as possible. And again, yeah, that... for those that you guys want to see some examples, um, again, I cannot recommend this paper enough. It's, it goes through very uh, great details of how to how to do these calcs and, and it shows you in a great number. So I just I thought it would be really boring to go through these. <laughs> Good. Um, and then the last point I think is good. Uh, there's a question. Let's say you're trying to um, uh, compensate for the missed dose. And so for your remaining fractions, you're going to do higher dose per fraction. Generally, we recommend not to do um, 
a dose fits maybe more than five gray per fraction because there your um, your um, linear quadratic model starts to be a little bit less accurate for those really high dose per fractions. When when that was developed, it, it wasn't it wasn't planned around SBRT type doses. Um, so I, I mean, the question is, if you have treatment interruption, can you compensate for missed dose? Let's say with a, a single fraction of SBRT for relatively small tumors. <laughs> That's a tough question. I mean, if it's, again, I think the question becomes, you know, what is around it and what is, what's, what's your, um, what are the, what's your late tissue toxicities that you're going to be worried about? If it's a truly a solitary, like a lung med or something, I think you could probably compensate for it. But uh, yeah, it's a very difficult question to answer. I think. Mm -hmm. But I agree. I, uh, the idea of trying to hypofractionate the remaining fractions is, within reason, right? Again, don't do it. If you're already hyperfractionating, you probably don't want to hyperfractionate anymore. If, you, if your original plan was already going at a high dose per fraction, you probably don't want to increase that. You just want to add on the dose and add on some fractions. Um, and you want to spread everything out as best as possible. If you're going to increase your fractionation, uh, your dose per fraction, excuse me, excuse me, your total dose, you want to spread out the, the amount of increase over the amount of fractions you have left. And that's why treatment interruptions towards the end of your treatment are always kind of hard to compensate because you don't have that much time left, if that makes sense. Okay, wonderful. Let's resume where, uh, where you left off. Okay. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the time, at least for, for me, what I've, I've had is that I don't have matched machines. Um, so let's say that a machine goes down and there isn't an easy way to move patients around uh, within the clinic. So you have a lot of options. Um, you can wait for the repairs and then basically resume the treatment soon that day if the repair is quick. Um, you can replan, like somebody mentioned, you can replan onto a different uh, machine within your clinic that is available, excuse me. Um, or you can even, if there are other clinics around, you can actually partner with other clinics too. You know, this obviously gets a little bit more difficult, but uh, I, I've heard this happen where, you know, a, a, server, a, a machine goes down where there's only one living accelerator and you can move patients around if there's another clinic, like a private clinic somewhere around. Um, and then obviously let the patient miss their fraction and then use, you know, either accelerated scheduling or an actual, you know, BED calculation to compensate for the mistreatment later. <clears throat> so sort of the steps that we take when we have a broken machine. Um, we get an estimate of the repair, right? That's sort of your first thing that you have to figure out. It's how long is this machine going to be down? And for us, sometimes that's a challenge. So I can't imagine what it is for you guys, you know, where parts are like days away. It, it can be very difficult. But plan for the worst. You know, if, the, if your service engineer says I'll be done in 10 minutes, probably plan for a couple of hours just because that gives you uh, a little bit better um, wiggle room in the end. Uh, you can triage the patients, sort of like what we talked about earlier. It's really nice if you have a category, or have patients categorized already for you. You can kind of go through and say, okay, these are the patients that we must treat. These patients we can leave for a couple of days, no problem. Um, and if you do have patients that you're going to move to a different machine, that you know, okay, these head and neck patients we have to treat today, just start the replans right away. Even if you have, um, uh, even if you don't use these plans, if your original machine gets repaired, it's, it's, it's not a big deal. You, you've you know, wasted a little bit of planning time, but it's much better than to be in the alternate position where the machine is actually down longer than you expect, but you haven't replanned the patients and now they're actually going to be delayed. Um, and the really nice thing for 3D is that this isn't actually that difficult. You already have a good plan that the doctor liked, so you can reproduce it even on a different machine from scratch pretty quickly because you know the angles, you know the energies, you know the field shapes. Uh, whereas when you're in the VMAT IMRT world, this becomes very difficult. Basically, you start from scratch most often. So um, basically, you know, my suggestion is just get, get onto the planning as, as fast as possible if you're going to replan the patient. Clearly document everything. I think this is really important, whether you're going to allow the patient to miss the treatments or you're going to do a replan. This also has to be very diligent because the situation here often is very chaotic. Uh, you're doing things that usually take weeks in a couple of hours. So, um, you know, be very diligent, be very careful and document everything. And the mistreatments, uh, it's very important to document mistreatments because, you know, they can miss a treatment 
kind of like a week ago and then to miss two today. And so you have to make sure that you're accounting for all the mistreatments, not just, you know, the, the path, what's happening right now. You have to know what, what are, has already happened in that patient. And again, coordinate. Um, the best way to kind of describe this is that you want, it's like an emergency response. You want one group or one person to kind of be telling everybody what to do. You don't want people working kind of uh, separately. Uh, and often what, what happens is that you, you want to be doing this in a sort of cycle, right? So as you get an estimate of how long the repair is going to take, you kind of go through this, this process and then you go back and say, okay, are we still on track? Are we still looking at it, you know, a couple hours? Because repairs for the, for the um, Linux, they, they can get pretty complicated and they can get changed, right? You try one part thinking that that's what's going to solve it and it turns out that wasn't the problem at all. Um, and that this happens a lot. And so it's really important to kind of have this cycle of constantly talking to each other, having uh, and communicating with each other. So I want to contrast a little bit about service. Uh, basically, you know, there's two ways of doing it. You can kind of pay the, the, the Linux vendor um, some uh, in order to have a contract. So this is sort of the best in terms of um, they're going to they, they know the machines the most. They can tap into a lot of resources from the vendor. Uh, and kind of get repairs done as fast as possible. However, it's often very expensive. And um, you can get longer response times in, in this way because they're probably not local to your area. They have to fly in, they have to fly in parts. Um, but that said, like with everything that has happened recently in this past year, uh, everybody's kind of starting to figure out ways to do things remotely. And so, for example, for Varian, with the machines we have, we have an excellent system of able to build. They're able to log into your, your uh, Linux and basically see everything. Uh, they have oscilloscopes that are embedded in it so they can, you can trouble, troubleshoot it uh, through the internet um, with you just at the machine. And we've fixed our, our Linux there numerous times without anybody actually even showing up on site. So this is a huge benefit if that's the point that you go. The alternative to that is obviously training your in-house hospital biomedical engineer staff or, or, or engineers to take care of the, the Linux. And unfortunately, in-house training can be a little bit um, inadequate because these are very specialized machines and there's, there's not a lot of experience out there. And so often you need to send your, uh, your, your repair man um, to vendor specific training, which can be expensive. But usually, you know, they're already on your payroll, so you don't have to pay them as much. Uh, and they're always on site or they're usually on site. And so uh, they can usually um, respond very quickly to any breakdown. But regardless of which way you go, one of the biggest things that I saw, I was looking over uh, some of these Linux uptimes, meaning how, how, um, how, how, how often is the Linux broken? Uh, and it's significantly higher in um, low to middle, middle income countries. And that's mostly, they, this paper found out, it's mostly due to the experience of the person who's doing the service. They just don't know the machines as well. And number two was wait times for spare parts. And um, again, when I worked in Prince George uh, in, in Northern Canada, this was the case. Like if a part wasn't available, it would take up, up to two days to receive a part. And so what we did was we worked with our hospital administration to basically buy up a lot of these common parts that kind of go down and have them on hand. Um, so it was a big purchase up front, but it saved us a lot of downtime. And so things like MLC motors, bulbs, even common circuit boards, if you talk to your um, uh, your vendor, they, they can tell you, you know, these are the things that often break down. And so you can have these on, on hand and you will use them eventually. And, you know, you have an inventory of a parts depot. The other thing that's really important is preventative maintenance. And this is, um, you know, the term, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. By having service come and do these preventative maintenances, you know, they'll check the machine. They can spot problems that are about to arise and have a major downtime. Uh, they can they can spot that, uh, and so it's really important to have these preventive maintenance done, which can be challenging, right? Because they take a long time to do. Uh, I think uh, estimate about ten days a year that you need for preventive maintenance, and so um, as a result, you need to include this in your clinic schedule. So if your clinic schedule is running sixteen hours a day, the service is not going to have time to come in and do this preventative maintenance, which can probably be worse off in the long run. One of the other things I want to mention is really bad, uh, is even if we're really bad with it, is that often a Linux will go down, a uh, service will come in and repair it, and then they just give it right back to the therapists. And this is a really a big no. Uh, physics has to come in and check the machine afterwards to make sure that it's, it's appropriate for clinical treatments. 
And there's countless misadministration incidents that have been reported in exactly in this way where the service will reset something or put in a new board, things change. They're not clinical staff. They don't know what to look for. And then the machine gets released to treat patients and you will mistreat a lot of patients without realizing it. And there's other documentation that you can look at from the vendors, even if you don't have a service contract, they always will have documentation online so you can review this. Uh, there's on-site vendor training. Often if you buy a machine, they will send you or they'll send somebody for training. So this is a really good useful uh, use. Make sure that you do use that. Don't let it just not happen. And then help centers. You can always call someone, uh, even if you pay per time, it's always nice to just be able to pick up the phone, call and talk to somebody to get some feedback uh, for what your approach is going to be. So I'm not sure if there's anybody from like the hospital administration on these chats, but I'm sure some of you have, have leadership roles. Um, and so one of the things I want to really mention is that this, you know, this costs money to keep a clinic running well costs money, and this has to be budgeted for it. Often we get into these um, strange scenarios where there's a lot of money when you purchase a machine, but there's very little money for like the, the annual budget that it takes to run the machine effectively. And so you, if I, if I could you know, convince you that you need to focus on the second part as much as you focus on the first part, um, your Linux will be a lot more operationally active. And then budgeting time is also the, really important. Uh, again, QA, training, and preventative maintenance take, take a lot of time. We have very busy schedules. And so I think somebody from leadership have to say, no, we have to do this. Otherwise, it's going to be worse in the long run. And this is kind of becoming the last point here is having a dedicated IT team for radiation oncology. Often IT in hospitals is treated sort of uh, kind of outsourced and it's treated as like a peripheral uh, uh, need. You know, something that somebody that takes care of the pager system or takes care of, you know, uh, the, the, the phone calls. But really for radiation oncology, because we live in such an integrated system of different systems talking to each other and networking, uh, it's totally vital to have IT as an integral part of radiation oncology. So it's, again, something I would stress for hospital administration to view it differently than they would probably normally do. And I think this has already been mentioned a few times in other talks, but having a way to talk about uh, incidents at your, at your clinic and review them. You know, so again, have an opportunity to, to, for feedback to give, or for, me, for staff to give feedback about incidents that happen, whether it's a machine breaking down or a patient missing treatment because they're far away. Uh, the hospital administration should know there should be like a loop that people can tell the, you know, the hospital, this is what's happening, this is, this is bad for the patient, and you can review that and create different processes and different changes in your workflows to, to make it better. And likewise, you know, sort of incident review is after something happens, but you can have quality improvement initiatives, which is sort of before something happens. So the hospital can create like a reward system in order to encourage people to think about, well, well how can I improve this? And again, this seems kind of um, like work that doesn't need to be done, but in reality, most of the time, these quality improvement initiatives, uh, they actually you know, increase efficiency at the clinic. They increase the amount of time that the LINAC is running versus broken. They get people to think about it differently. And so it actually improves the, the quality of care and it improves the efficiency of the clinic. So you'll get more out of it. So at this point, I was going to start to go down a, a list of like common errors and maybe what to do with them. And I realized this is a really, this would be a really long list. And uh, I don't think I could do a good job describing these because everybody's situation is a lot different than everybody else's. So I just think this topic is too broad to try and give good clinical answers. So hopefully this talk isn't that long. So maybe we can chat about your specific questions like you have them. I think that's probably the better way to do it. But a couple of things I do want to mention in general is policies and standards, right? It, it becomes so much um, when something happens, whether the machine goes down or a patient misses or a patient's not fitting into their, their immobilization because they've lost weight. It happens pretty infrequently. Um, you know, usually we do great treatments and we run them pretty, you know, most of the time it run, we run very well. And so it's really easy when something happens to kind of forget about what we did to solve the problem. So I think writing stuff down and creating a very, it could be an informal guideline, but it runs, uh, it becomes very, very useful for when you're doing things kind of on the fly and you have an emergency situation, you can just pick up this piece of paper and read off what you're supposed to do. I think it's, it's really, really good. And at the same time, if something does happen, again, 
take a moment after you, you know, after everything's settled down, after the machine's repaired, after the patient, you know, we've made a new shell for the patient, take a moment and really assess, okay, what happened? What can we do better next time? And, you know, take a moment to figure out how to adjust your workflows. And again, this is kind of viewing the clinic as a system. So you, you know, you guys are all here to learn. And I think that's a, already shows that you're so far uh, down this path that you're already looking at it at the clinic, not something that just provides a service. You're just looking, now you're starting to look at it, how can I make this better? How can I review this and kind of make this thing as, as good as possible? And another big thing about, you know, overcoming challenges is that the people that are working through the challenges have to have opportunity to grow. And so I really want to focus this last little bit about professional education and development. And um, if you give patients, or if you, excuse me, if you give your staff the time and the resources to get better, uh, they will become the champions, the leaders and the problem solvers for you. And so challenges will be overcome naturally because you have people who are becoming, you know, better and more developed in their careers, rather than if everybody is just maxed out and stressed and there's no time to even think about things, you'll never, uh, you'll never get better and you'll never um, overcome some of your challenges that you're looking at. So basically it's looking at, you know, your therapists, nurses and doctors and physicists more as like a leadership part rather than just providing a service for the hospital. So Shada actually asked me to highlight the medical physics accreditation program. And this is just one example of what, you know, what this looks like. Um, so there's a body called the I International Medical Physics Certification Board uh, that can, you know, conduct examinations for your physicists and, and they, or they can work with your existing um, accreditation bodies to, to figure out if, you know, if their standards are, are good. And ultimately, they, what you can say is that you can ensure that the physics group that you're working with, um, you know, they, they can meet international guidelines, uh, standards, and they know, you know, the international kind of approaches to things. But at the same time, it encourages them to become leaders in their clinic. So it's now you have a certification. Now you have this proof and this, this confidence in yourself, and you can start to implement certain things in your clinic. So I think it does, um, you know, I'm sure the therapists, I'm sure the doctors all have this, these different bodies that can help them through this. But continuing education and professional development is very important. So the last little bit I want to kind of talk about seeking help. Um, so there's lots of opportunities for getting help. Uh, if you have, you know, if you have, uh, a, a, there's lots of resources, basically. So um, I just mentioned a few here, for example, the IAEA can do calibration audits. So for your physics team, you guys can ask for a calibration audit for photons only. I don't think electrons are, are supported. And they can uh, either come in or send you nanodots and you can irradiate them to make sure that you have calibration that you think you're, you know, how you calibrated is accurate. They have a lot of regulatory guidance, so if you have any questions about shielding or things like that, they can answer a lot of questions. There's um, lots of organizations that produce, uh, that give um, educational seminars and symposia that are, you know, it's useful like this to always be learning and developing. Uh, I think the ICRU has come up a lot, and there's um, basically they created these standards that most of radiation therapy is built on, so you can get these reports and you can read them if you want, or there's presentations done by the the members of these of these groups. Likewise, national um, uh, organizations are really important too. So, for example, the APM is the Physics Association in the U.S. They have a ton of different reports and educational materials that you can go online and you can learn about all this. Astro and Estro are the radiation oncologist kind of um, societies, and again, they have a lot of practice guidelines, different ways um, you know that you can look up, even like what kind of immobilization you should get for what types of treatments that you're going to perform. So very, a lot of detail, a lot of um, different uh, opportunities for help, but just by looking at different countries' uh, uh, organizations. And obviously, there's a lot of um, charities and, and nonprofits that are in this field. So Radiating Hope, Rad Aid, and us, uh, the RCC, you know, there's lots of opportunity there for equipment donations, monetary donations to clinics. And um, outreach and training as well. Rad Aid is sending a lot of people out to actually like embed them in clinics to help uh, refine workflows and help out. Which brings me to the last bit. There's a lot of opportunity in academic centers too. I know we do a lot of outreach. Uh, I know you know lots of universities in the states are looking for partners in developing countries or low to middle income countries to try and help. Uh, and really, there isn't like an ulterior motive to this. Often, it's just you know, good, good Samaritan work that we want to, to bring 
advanced treatments to uh, global health and expand global health. Um, and so there's a lot of work, a lot of opportunity there if you're interested to connect with universities and, and see if there's something that you can um, create a partnership there. And last but certainly not least is your peers. And I think forums like these that Ben has created are, it's an amazing thing to create a network, not only with, you know, with us, the lecturers or the people from our, the RCC, but yourselves as well, right? So on these talks, I think we have seven different clinics in a region. Um, and hopefully, you know, you start to connect to each other and really use that opportunity to try and um, work with each other too. If you have any problems, you can always reach out to us, myself, I'm sure. Ben and, and the, the rest of the group I would be willing to help. But now you also have, you know, a network of peers that are in similar situations to you. Um, and you can always tap into that and, and work with each other to try and you know, solve some problems that you're going to be you know, have. Um, and that's about it that I had. And like I said, I think we're a little short on time or maybe not. So we can talk about some questions here. Thank you very much, Piotr. As always, a wonderful talk. Um, really enjoyed it and learned a lot. Um, at this time, if there are any questions, feel free to type them. We the the topic of mistreatments is is a very hot topic, and so one person asked, um, you know, what if I'm doing a nasopharynx case and the patient gets 16 out of the 25 fractions, and then they stop for one month? What do I do? And what about the spinal cord? And so in the chat box, you'll see I've, I've done the math using the, the formula that was shown on one of the earlier slides to show how I think about this. I'm not going to talk all of it because it's, it's just lots of numbers, but hopefully that makes sense. Um, and then there's another question from uh, Mieda. If the patient's under the device and then the device malfunctions and the patient receives half of the dose, how do I make up for the remaining dose? <laughs> I think that's an interesting scenario. Um, it, it actually happens a lot too for us. Um, we tend to, uh, like, we'll just for the next fraction, again, it depends on you know, what kind of treatment you're doing, but oftentimes we'll make up that a little bit that was. Um, not delivered the next time, the next fraction. So the next fraction will deliver a fraction and a half. Um, that's sort of how we we kind of handle that um, in, in our center. Yeah, the hypofractionated regimens that becomes difficult. I guess the idea of hypofractionated mis you know, gaps in hyperfractionation uh, become more difficult, right? Because you're already running at higher dose rates or dose per fraction. Um, I think it's, it's difficult. You, you, I think the, from that UK policy, their um, recommendation is to recalculate the plans back to conventional fractionation and continue from there on, uh, rather than continuing to try and make up dose with you know, SBRT, for example, um, which kind of makes sense because you're kind of, you're, you're going back to something that's a little bit more safe. An advantage of hyperfractionation is that you are trying to squeeze in the last treatments while finishing the treatment from start to end still in the same amount of time. Um, but uh, sometimes you can get more side effects with hyperfractionation. Uh, I recommend at least six hours in between each fraction in order to allow the chance for the normal tissues to repair. Um, but uh, Yes, uh, so some hyperfractionation, you know, maybe at the end of the at the end of a treatment, doing two treatments on the last day, for instance, is, is very common. But doing lots of hyperfractionation, I think you'd have to be careful. Um, and Piotr, actually, maybe the, oh yeah, <laughs> go for sorry, it. Sorry, the, the that paper that I wrote actually, I might go back to it. Um, they also have like a secondary BED calculation that you can actually put in your time between fractions to see what the hyperfractionation regimens would look like as well, um, because they do add up to, uh, to a little bit of uh, increased pelvic tissue toxicities, yeah. And maybe you can go back to the slide where we show all the, the common different kinds of ways that you can experience challenges. We, we can reflect on that as we're thinking about any final questions. Um, 
I think I think it's towards the end actually. It's it's a list. Yes. <laughs> like I said, I was starting to do it and I just got so overwhelmed. I felt like this lady in the picture. I just said, there's probably so many ways that things can go wrong uh, that it's just really difficult. So I think instead, I, I think I would just encourage you, know, you guys to reach out to us, you know, whether it's on this call or afterwards. Um, I think it's, you know, we're, we're happy to help. So you know, we'd always try and uh, help as best, as best as we could, but covering everything from scratch would be just very difficult. And one thing that we can do if, if everyone wants to, we can make a WhatsApp group with members from each clinic on it. And it can be dedicated to if there's questions about 3D treatment. You know, doing this transition from 2D to 3D, you don't, we don't want you to feel alone. Oh, yes, yes. Is there a question? Mm -hmm. Okay, Kotar says that uh, she thinks this is a great idea. Please, um, please let me know if it, in the chat if you also want to make a WhatsApp group for uh, 2D to 3D alumni. Okay. It looks like people are saying this is an excellent idea. So, um, you know, what, what we'll do is we'll send a message to each clinic coordinator at your site, and they can send us a list of phone numbers uh, that we'll add to the, the WhatsApp group for whoever wants to be part of it. Um, and then uh, I'll also invite um, as volunteers, any of our educators who also want to be involved in the chat, um, and we'll 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 see how it goes. We'll just take it from there and kind of see how people like the group. But I think it's a, a nice idea to stay in touch, and um, maybe you can help answer each other's questions too. Um, and you know, ultimately, you guys will be the, the new teachers for your regions. And then um, just a few announcements. So now that we've reached the end of the curriculum, um, we're, we wanna get ready for um, the final evaluation. So just like you took uh, a test at the beginning of the course, we now want to do the test for the final, um, final evaluation. So we're gonna send out a link to the final exam. It will be multiple choice. There's no time limit um, once you start the exam, uh, but we want you to finish the exam in the next two weeks, okay? Um, let us know if you're missing any of the slides. We can send you the slides so that you can study. And uh, also we have our video recordings on YouTube. Uh, in addition, we'll send one uh, survey that we'd like you to fill out that talks about uh, what your experience has been with the course and how you feel confident in certain aspects. And these two things, the survey and the final exam will be required for everyone to get certificate of participation that we will issue after we look at the results. Um, there's no penalty for low score but we do hope that you show improvement and we look forward to any comments that you want to include in, in the forms. Any questions? Um, so I don't see any logistical questions, but I do see one final sort of physics question. 
uh, what can we do if, okay. So oh. what can we do if the CT breakdown between phase one and phase two for one month, should we calculate the gap also? Um, and Dr. Pruader said, uh, yes, um, calculate the gap. Um, the treatment courses for the combined phase one and phase two, so you would need to try to compensate for that gap and would look for our alternative to the CT, maybe use comb beam. Yeah, we've done that in the past where we've, um, we've used our comb beams uh, to, to try and mimic the CT as best as possible. Um, it's better than, than not scanning a patient and letting them wait. Or again, um, often, uh, you know, CTs are a little bit more prevalent. There's a lot, a little bit more. So maybe partnering with a, a, a nearby organization to scan patients for you um, if that's possible. Great question. Thank you, Abdul. Okay, well, we are past the hour. So everyone have a good day. Have a good evening. Piotr, thank you so much for taking the time to share this excellent presentation. Sarah is lovely to join you. And uh, Sarah, if you want to say a final message in Arabic, um, you're welcome to. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. شكرا لكم جميعا وان شاء الله بنشوفكم في سيشنز مختلفين بتوفيق ورنا لو عندكم اي اسئله موافقين take care everyone bye bye